Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today we tackle another sword disassembly and specifically this German IOD-89. This is a sword we talked about a few videos ago and while going through its details, its features, its marks and its history, I mentioned that the peened tang was likely hidden by this end cap. And I was actually wrong. The, the reason I said that was that even at a pretty close look, this whole section, so this partial back strap and the pommel area, seem to be all one solid piece of brass. But that is not the case. Luckily, I received a couple of messages from some of you who mentioned that in some cases, German IOD swords actually have a threaded tang, and by unscrewing the end cap here, the whole sword can be easily taken apart. And much to my surprise, when I actually went to try and see if this was indeed threaded on, it was. So this is a sword that can be taken apart. Easily is to be seen, as we'll talk about in just a moment. I'm not saying it's the case for all of them, but for this one specifically, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. But it can be taken apart and reassembled pretty quickly. So without further talking, we'll do exactly that. Okay, so let's start with the disassembly. The first thing I wanted to show you is how precisely the end cap here fits on the rest of the pommel. So I'm sure now that you know it's threaded, you can probably see, but you can, I hope, also understand how, without knowing that at a first impression, this looks like one solid piece. Moreover, I wanna show you how easily this unscrews. So, there we go. And I don't know if you can hear that, but it's so, so smooth. So once you thread this off, there's quite a few threads to it because you can even see some traces of gilding left and the precise threads in there. Make sure you don't drop this cap because this comes off really easily. So there we can see the cap. Also with traces of gilding still in, on the inside. Now, the first obstacle is removing the grip, or at least was for me. In my case, everything, this whole um, hilt uh, assembly was so tightly um, connected that it was really impossible to even have any play in it. So I tried moving the blade, I tried wobbling it around, hoping to dislodge it, but it did not work. What in the end I had to do was use a leather, a thick leather, piece of leather and a metal punch, so a piece of metal like this, and I hammered on it, making sure that I was not giving extremely heavy blows. And that eventually dislodged the tang from the grip, but still it took quite some time. So if you're trying it and you're having this difficulty, just keep going. It'll slowly, slowly dislodge one millimeter at a time, maybe even less, but eventually it will come apart. But do make sure you use something to soften the blow. So a piece of thick leather or something similar. Now, hopefully the grip will come apart easily. It does require some work. So even once you get it back in place, like even once you've removed it once, it still proves to be quite hard to remove. So actually I'll hit it again a couple of times so you see what I'm doing. Okay, so I'll try to do this in a way that's safe for me and for the sword. Let's see if we can get it on video too. That would be ideal. So the first thing is put this little leather um, spacer it's just basically a buffer to make sure that the tang doesn't get damaged by any hammer blows. And I should probably add the hammer blows should not be too strong. You just need to be delicate with this. The second thing I use is this punch. This is used for rivets or for snap buttons, for example, but it's very convenient because it has a concave tip here, so it fits very well on the tang without slipping away. 
And once those are in place, the difficult part to do on video, I think, is going to be whack it a couple of times with a hammer. So what you hopefully want to see here is that as you hit it delicately, the tank should slowly move down into the grip. And this won't unlock in one blow. So it's not gonna be like a one hit free, but it's slowly going to move down one millimeter at a time, maybe even less. So make sure you see that you are, that the tank is actually moving down through the grip. I won't show this on video because I cannot keep the blade still while filming and make sure I don't also damage the blade or my hand. So I'll see you in just one second once I've removed the grip. Okay, so as you can see here, the tang has moved down a few millimeters, almost maybe a centimeter down the grip. And at this point, it's loose enough that we can actually remove it. Okay, so the grip finally came off. It took about 10, 15 light blows with the hammer and it does lodge in place very well even after it's been reassembled. So this isn't a sword that's going to stay loose once you take it apart, at least as far as I can tell. Um, we can see its wooden core. And one thing you really wanna be careful when taking it apart is that since you're probably gonna be gripping it from the grip or if you do, just make sure you're very careful with the thread because these are delicate and they can break. So I think it's very interesting to see here the way the metal thread is kept in place. So you can see these wooden chip shims that kept it in place for over 100 years. So the method definitely works. We can also see that the chagrin here is very well glued to the wood, so there's no looseness to it. There's no risk that this is going to come apart. Let's look at the rest of the sword now. Okay, so we have this nice hilt assembly, and the first thing you wanna do is remove the leather ring. This, depending on what condition your leather is in, can be a rather delicate step because it can be super dry or damaged, but in this case, it's solid enough that I'm not excessively concerned. So if we remove the ring, let's take a look at that. What we have is a, could be even a cardboard core here. So you can see that it's not a full one piece of leather. There's a core, a light core in the center, and then you have two uh, edges of leather that are stitched onto it. This room here, this cutout is for the, well, we'll check it in a second, but it's for the retainer of the, there's a, a spring that holds the folding shell guard in place. So that cutout makes room for it. And yeah, this may need some reconditioning to be back to supple, soft leather. And then we have our hilt structure. So as you can see, the hilt and knuckle guard are one piece. Well, except for the folding shell guard here. Here we have a spring that holds basically the, um, ensures that this is in, uh, stays in place. And you can see it popping out there on the side. This kind of is a bit of an obstacle to removing the hilt because as you can see, it kind of bubbles here and makes it a little bit of an obstacle. But if you pull it enough or push this spring down, it will eventually come away. So I won't film that because it's, uh, it's tough to do while filming, but I'll see you again in a second once it's removed. And here we go. The whole assembly is removed. Let's first take a look at the um, hilt, but there's nothing really unusual here that we hadn't already seen in the previous video. And we can take a look at the blade too. In many cases, I was told, you might find numbers or marks on the tang or underneath, let's say, the area that normally is hidden from the eye, but 
it does not seem to be the case here. Here you see the spring again. It's rather strong. We can see some coarse file marks. There is a bit of rust, so I'm going to clean this up before we reassemble it. But no numbers, marks, or anything that I can see. So unfortunately, even after removing the rust and cleaning it, no inscriptions, no dates, no numbers popped up on this blade. So it's just an unmarked blade. A bit disappointing for me and for maybe those of you who are hoping to see some secret under the, the grip, but that is not the case for this sword. There we go. It's fairly straightforward to put back in place. As you see, again, you just need to get over the, the hump here of the, of the spring. Okay, we then grab the leather ring, making sure we put it down up on the correct side. And once this is removed, it's fairly straightforward to put back. We then grab the grip assembly. So together with the, don't forget the brass ring. push this in place. And this part here is where you're going to need to really push this with some strength. You want it to really move back in place. You don't want it to be loose or anything. So there's still a few millimeters, I think, that we can, and also you can see from the ring here. So now this is not the easiest thing with oily hands, but it moved back in place. I felt it move. You can see that the tang thread is now almost at the edge of the grip, so we're quite good. The ring is also solid, so we can put the end part here of the pommel in place. Make sure that the it's connected to the knuckle bow here. Everything is tightly and firmly in place. And then, last but not least, we screw the end cap on. So I just want to show you again how smoothly this goes in place. And not just that, but I think the thing that most surprised me is how precisely when you reach the end of the thread, so the end of its run, the Yeah, you see the cap aligns perfectly with the pommel. There's no extra movement here. This is its end of the, of the run for the thread, and it's perfectly aligned to the pommel. This is really great machining. So there we go. So the IOD89 proves to be a fairly straightforward sword to take apart and to reassemble. Once you get through that possible obstacle of loosening all of the elements that are so tightly bound together. And this tight connection is a testament, I think, to German manufacturing at the time. It almost feels in certain cases, especially with how smooth the thread of the cap here and how it blends perfectly with the rest of the pommel to make it seem like one solid piece. It almost seems like pre precision machining. And it's really, um, quite surprising that they put so much care and effort and precision into making these swords.